welcome to Skagit Valley and Whidbey NMRA Clinic. We're going to have Rich Tom tonight. He's going to talk about some bridge projects he has on his uh, Coldwater Creek and Cascade HO scale railroad down in the fine town of Coopville. I started this railroad in 2008. A handful of you guys have operated uh, on the layout. It's in a room 11 feet by 16, an odd shaped spare bedroom. I had a lot of good advice to start operating as soon as possible, which I did. Started op sessions in 2011. Really tired of the plywood Pacific kind of thing. So I went ahead and I put in scenery, at least 90% of it, but I didn't build bridges, which was uh, in hindsight, something of a mistake. You can see way back here in the background uh, below White Mountain, some unfinished bridge locations that I just spanned with the sub roadbed. Get operating as quickly as possible, but have a reasonable looking layout uh, as opposed to the all plywood kind of thing. So I didn't build any bridges before scenicing, which is a sort of a bass backwards way of doing it, but that's the way I did it. So there are seven small bridges down here on this end of the layout, and I tried to do the easiest ones first. I started out with some very simple ones. These are obviously through girders, which uh, you can uh, kit bash from Central Valley girder sections, which are very cheap. This is the first one I built. Nothing spectacular about it at all, other than it's on a curve and on a grade. It spanned uh, two tracks at two different levels. Uh, you have to be uh, a little bit careful, do a drawing. I use the Central Valley plate girder bridges. The only things you need to take care with is when you do the skew, make sure you offset by an even number of panels. In this case, one panel on this span and two panels on this span and not, for example, 1.4 panels because that's girder framework under the bridge, of course, is all orthogonal and not at an angle. So uh, you can't offset by anything other than an even number of panels. Other than that, it's uh, pretty simple. So that one turned out all right. It's on a, a curve and uh, on a grade. So I uh, sort of copied that idea and bridge number two was a shorter version. On This one is on a 4% grade. Again, kit bash from a Central Valley kit. These are extremely easy to do. My railroad is, was built in two, two parts. The first part was built in the late 19th century and then there was a new addition built about 30 years later. And so I reasoned that I could use these uh, more modern uh, steel spans on the newer section and uh, uh, wood bridges on the older section, as you'll see in the section. In the background here is another bridge down on White Mountain. This is on a logging branch where I just used uh, logs. So for trestles, uh, I, I had three or four trestles in mind. I'm the kind of guy I have to build, uh, draw drawings for everything. I don't just start building. Uh, everything I build has a drawing associated with it. So nothing uh, unusual here. As usual, I built a jig for two purposes, not only to glue the bent together, but also to hold it in place while sawing. I have clamps on my jig made out of styrene so that I can hold the uh, bents in place while I use a razor saw to make a precision cut. I've tried uh, to use the Northwest short line chopper to cut dull and I just am hopelessly incompetent with that. So uh, I use uh, for round bents, uh, 14 inches in HO scale is, is 3 16 of an inch. So that's the kind of pine dowel that you pick up at Ace Hardware someplace. It's not basswood, so it uh, doesn't cut as easily as basswood does. So the jig I made is uh, very standard and typical, uh, except it serves two functions. It, it uh, aligns the parts for gluing, and then I can use it to cut the bents as well. And I'm, of course, I made it long enough for my tallest bridge, which was about 14 inches high. So I only needed one jig for uh, the trestles. Nothing unusual about that. Here's one of the short trestle spans on the line leading to lumber mill. And then a longer bent trestle that spans the uh, mill pond of the future a lumber mill that just mocked up back here. Now, all these bridges were built, as I said earlier, bass backwards. 
I fabricated the stringers assembly first and then put it in place. And then in, in the case of this trestle, slid the bents underneath the stringer assembly, making sure everything is square and uh, then glued top of the bents, the caps to the, the stringer assembly. And, uh, for easy removal later, when this layout eventually gets dis disassembled, which it will, they're not glued on the water. Uh, the, it's just held by gravity down here. So there's nothing gluing these bents to the surface of the water, which is matte medium, by the way. So I wanted some variety in my bridges. So uh, this is another very small span on a curve and also on a grade. It's a king post truss, just for variety, uh, sort of unusual. This is bridges eight and nine, the last two on the layout that I had to build. And for one, these are at the very entrance to the train room. So the first thing a visitor sees are these two bridges. So I felt they had to be pretty good. They had to be foreground models. The other point that I, I wanted to, I made earlier is that I put all the scenery in first without any real forethought about what kind of bridge would go here. What kind of bridge would I put here? What kind of bridge would I put here? I really didn't think that through. I also used, as I talked about in an earlier clinic, uh, rubber rocks. All these outcroppings here are not plaster, uh, Bragdon rocks or anything similar. They're rubber rocks that are cut with scissors and hot glued in place and then uh, painted, which I described in an earlier clinic. So I sort of went wild on this particular little canyon here. Uh, this whole this whole side of the canyon is, is uh, vertical rocks as well as this uh, section down here and here. That very much affected what kind of bridge I would put in. So here's bridge eight and bridge nine. For bridge eight, I could have uh, easily used another through girder bridge. That was sort of plain. Uh, and I wanted this bridge to be a little more eye-catching. So I chose to use a uh, wooden deck truss. You can find plans uh, anywhere. I found some, uh, plans in the Model Railroad magazine several years ago. So nothing unusual about this bridge at the bench and not on the layout. Here it is pretty much completed, all stained up and ready to put in place. So this is a wooden deck truss. So this is maybe the unusual part, and I'm not recommending this as a general approach, but uh, just recall, I built my scenery before I built my bridges. So the approach was that uh, I cut away the sub road bed. In this case, uh, it was uh, a half inch plywood and cut that away, leaving the, the track in, in place. And then you uh, remove the, uh, this is micro, Microengineering uh, flex track. So you snap out the, the ties. So far, so good. So I made some clamps where I clamped this uh, prefabricated bridge that I had built on the bench to the rails. Uh, this is sort of tricky. You have to do it right, get everything lined up. The next step is to build the uh, abutments underneath the bridge. Uh, again, sort of bass backwards. Uh, this, this is a finicky bit. This takes a lot of measuring. Um, I used a mixture of hardboard and mat board, uh, whatever I had lying around uh, to mock up concrete piers. So uh, this is the trickiest part of the bridge construction. You would then remove those clamps and remove that prefabricated bridge span and complete the concrete piers, which I've done here, put in some scribe lines to represent some, uh, mold, what, I forget what the term is, and then uh, paint them. So you end up with something like this. So if I hadn't told you how I had built this bridge, you might have assumed I did it the normal way by building the piers and then building the bridge and then laying the track, which is opposite that. So this is bridge number nine. This is the longest bridge on the layout uh, on a curve, about a 20 inch radius curve. Here, the geology that I had pre-created without thinking about the bridge I was gonna put here sort of bit me. Uh, over on this side, I had a vertical piece of uh, granite here uh, and some earth 
So on this side, the south side of the bridge, um, I could use a, a normal uh, a wooden abutment. On this side, though, I had this vertical granite uh, wall. Pile driver crew came out one day to survey uh, and took a look at this. And they said, well, I don't know who surveyed this line, but we, we can't put, uh, we can't drive piles into that, that face. So this is gonna have to be a real oddball bridge. So what it turned out to be was a, a normal uh, bent trestle for part of it and an, a, a girder for the short section, which I'll show you in a second. So sort of the fun of this was building the scenery first and then coming back later as sort of a bridge engineer would, would do and say, well, what kind of a bridge am I gonna put here? So the main part of the uh, bent uh, uh, structure was built on the bench, nothing special here. To, this is the part over the water. Uh, I built a double bent here because there will be a, a, a plate girder uh, section resting on it. I decided since this was a foreground model to put NBW castings everywhere, everywhere they would be on this span. So they're on all of the, all the braces throughout. I thought that was worth it since it's a, a foreground model. And this is a close up showing uh, some of the uh, NBWs in place. So installing that uh, trestle, this is bridge number nine again, the nine and last, I'm happy to say. These are the three uh, bents that were built on the bench. And then these two were added later. And on the south end of the bridge, I was able, because of the terrain underneath, they were able to drive these piles into the soil. I could use a normal wood abutment. But on the north end, as you'll see, I had to use this short section of, uh, of girder, which rests on a concrete abutment. It's a little bit novel. It's, it's sort of an eye catcher. Uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit of detail that I thought was, was interesting. And again, a shot after installation of those NBWs. For you folks who have built bridges and, and put in full NBWs, it's tedious, but it's worth the effort. And it's even more tedious to, uh, to take uh, time to count them, which I did, but with COVID, there's not, there wasn't much else to do. So there are 561 MBWs in this little bridge. And this is the final scene now that you see when you enter the train room, instead of those two pieces of uh, soap road bed, you see uh, bridges eight, bridge nine. And that's it, guys. Any questions? You did a real nice job, Rich. Thank you. I don't want to build any more bridges. Well, I need some. <laughs> Did you go insane, MDWs on there? Yeah. Well, I was uh, more or less insane to start with, uh, more so. Uh, <laughs> but it's it's certainly worth doing if the bridge is right in front of a visitor's nose. It's not worth doing if it's four feet in the background, in my opinion. You just can't see them, uh, especially in, in smaller scales like N. It's just not worth the trouble. Well, I, I think the bridges fit the area you're modeling, so they, they all look really good. Yeah, this, this is really cool looking. Do you have a single bridge with straight track on it? No, um, <laughs> it's 16 feet in this direction. You can't see the last four or five feet. And it's 11 feet in this direction everywhere. I did not include a single section of straight track anywhere. Every, every piece of track on the layout is a curve. And that was a deliberate decision just to make it different. The minimum radius is 18 inches, only on one place. Mostly it's 20 or 22. My largest locomotives are 280s and 40 foot freight cars. It's set 1928. So um, I, you know, I have short trains, uh, six, seven car trains, no passenger cars longer than about 60 feet. So the curves are too terribly uh, visible. Uh, in this section here, I have 85 feet of main line, which without a track diagram, I can't really show you, but it, it, it curves around, it goes up. There's, there's no helix. It just uh, goes up on a continuous 2% grade and then 4% up here and comes back around. And those, those of you who have been to the layout uh, can understand. So it's a small layout uh, for small trains. Any more questions? I'm sure it was an awful lot of extra work to build the trestles to fit the canyons 
But I tell you what, it looks like the canyons were there first and the trestles got built around them, which you don't see often on a lot of model railroads. They look really nice. Well, thank you. Well, yeah, I've actually seen or read in magazines modelers who have gone the whole nine yards and they just build scenery and then come in as a, uh, a surveyor would do and build the ro railroad later. I mean, that's really, that's really hardcore to do it that way. But this is sort of a, an in-between in approach where I didn't pick the bridge uh, in advance. Now, the, the downside is uh, I would have a heck of a time moving these bridges uh, to, uh, if I had to, another layout. So the right way to do this is to build an insert where you have the, the bridge that's actually sitting on a frame that you can move in and out uh, to build it at the bench and then plop it in the layout. I, I really am not recommending this bass backwards method of bridge building, but uh, it was fun. I really like your your drawings that you showed. Also, that's a uh, drawing like you'd see in Model Railroad or one of the national magazines. That's a that's a very nice drawing. Well, I, I the only credit I can give is to uh, a company that was called McDonnell Aircraft Corporation that I worked for in 1962 as a draftsman, and that's a that's a hard job to start out with, guys. I drew wing sections of Phantom F4 aircraft on a 16-foot drawing board for a year. It stuck with me. Once you once you draft, uh, do drawings as a professional, I guess I was a professional, uh, it sticks with you. But I, I can't build anything without doing one. I like the use of your jigs for building the vents and, and clamping the, the trestles in place. Well, that's pretty. That's, right, pretty, that's a good idea. That's pretty common. It's just styrene. This is, uh, yeah. I think. But you you have a hold down clamp to keep everything. Right. Uh, yeah. This is just quarter inch styrene square glued in to match the sides of the pilings. The pilings I used were 14 inch HO scale, which is three sixteenths uh, dowel. Some people just make a drawing, uh, and that's good. Put a put but a piece of wax your, paper over it. Your slide yep. number eight shows what I was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that uh, I just extended yeah. the idea. Yeah. Good idea. To to make the cuts because I just am I just can't use a chopper to make cuts on dowels. The, the dowel rolls around, mm -hmm. and I'm no good at it. So I clamp mm -hmm. it down. There are pieces of sandpaper here, by the way, to make sure that that dowel doesn't move when you start sawing. Okay. Well, thanks, folks. Thank you.